I wanted to start by talking a bit about Viktor Frankl mm. and this extraordinary book, Man's Search for Meaning, which many of you will know, some of you will not know at all, and um, probably my guess would be the largest category would be, yeah, I've heard of that, but I'm not actually totally sure what what's going on there, which is where I was until um, until recently. I mentioned on our last episode uh, that Zach and I went to the Holocaust Museum in DC when we were there a week ago, a week and a half ago. And a few weeks before that, I had found a copy of this book on, um, on our friend Dave Stevens' carefully curated uh, library on his boat when we were with him. Uh, in the Bahamas, and he had uh, encouraged me to to read it when I said, you know, I, I've been meaning to, and I haven't. He said, do. And uh, he offered you his copy. He, he declined it because that's the kind of guest you are. He offered me his copy, even though he had, you know, he's on a boat. He had a tiny library because he's on a boat, and I wasn't going to take his his copy. So um, this is not his copy, but he would he was willing to give give me his copy. Um, <clears throat> and then. I've also been listening to, and I think we'll end up talking a little bit about um, this later today, I've also been listening to Michael Schellenberger's uh, book, San Francisco, uh, on uh, audiobook recently, and I find him also invoking Frankel and Man's Search for Meaning. Uh, so there are a whole lot of sort of things pointing to, pointing to this, and I finally picked it up yesterday, and uh, I, I think I've mentioned, you know, I'm, I'm an avid reader, but I'm not that fast a reader, but I read the book yesterday and uh and it really uh it it really touched me deeply in so many ways so um i'm going to share a few excerpts and i've talked to you brett a little bit about it but not a ton uh and i believe you have not read it but you of course f- familiar with with him and and some of his story but let me tell a little bit about his story and then read a few expert experts <laughs> oh, it's gonna be that kind of day uh yeah. read a few excerpts uh to for us to talk about uh so frankel was born in vienna in 1905 he was a psychiatrist he became a psychiatrist he wasn't a psychiatrist when he was born interestingly mm. uh yeah he was uh, under underachiever i guess later <laughs> yes uh no <laughs> Why, you know, so, so like the opposite of the underachiever. Um, born in Vienna in 1905, became a psychiatrist, and he founded uh, what has been since called the Third School of Viennese Psychotherapy, Freud having founded the first, Alfred Adler having founded the second, and Frankel's what became called, what became known by him as logotherapy became known as the third school of Viennese psychotherapy, the main tenet of which is that the primary motivation for humans is to find meaning in their life. And um, here, before I say a little bit more about what what his story is, um, here from uh, an afterword in the book that he writes uh, a long time later, as logotherapy teaches, there are three main avenues on which one arrives at meaning in life. The first is by creating a work or by doing a deed. The second is by experiencing something or encountering someone. In other words, meaning can be found not only in work, but also in love. Most important, however, is the third avenue to meaning in life. Even the helpless victim of a hopeless situation, facing a fate he cannot change, may rise above himself, may grow beyond himself, and by so doing change himself. He may turn a personal tragedy into a triumph. It's quite an interesting taxonomy. It's quite an interesting taxonomy, isn't it? And I haven't heard one like it before. By 1939, remember he was born in 1905, by 1939, Frankel was the head of neurology at Rothschild Hospital in uh, Vienna. It was the only Jewish hospital in Vienna at the time. After the Nazis closed the hospital down, he was offered an American visa in 1942, which would have allowed him uh, to escape and to complete the book that he was working on, which was to be his first formalization of his, um, of, of logotherapy. He let the visa expire, though, because he did not want to abandon his parents in Vienna. That same year, in 1942, he and his new wife and his parents were imprisoned in a concentration camp. For him, it was the first of four concentration camps that he would be imprisoned in, uh, which included Auschwitz. He took with him the manuscript for the book that he was writing that would become uh, his his thesis on logotherapy, and it was, of course, taken from him um, at, at intake at the first concentration camp that he was at and lost. While imprisoned by the Nazis, Frankel found meaning broadly in two sources. 
The prospect of being reunited with his loved ones, specifically his wife and his parents. He was with his father in that first camp, and he unfortunately was was witness to his father's decline and death. So he knew that he had lost his father at some point, um, but he kept alive in his head um, the love that he felt for and the voice of specifically his his wife, but also of his the rest of his family that he was hoping was still alive. And he also found meaning in those many years that he was imprisoned in that series of concentration camps. Uh, the prospect of rewriting his manuscript, uh, now informed by his horrific years, seeing death and narrowly escaping death himself in the Nazi camps. On April 27th, 1945, Frankel was liberated. Uh, the camp was liberated and Frankel became free. And shortly thereafter, he learned that none of his family had survived. Everyone was gone. He wrote the first edition of this book, Man's Search for Meaning, over nine successive days within a year of the camp's liberation. And there is there are a couple of afterwards epilogues in this version of the book now that he wrote later. Uh, he went on to live a very long life, a very, a very successful, productive, meaningful life. Uh, but the vast majority of this book was written in nine days, within a year of him escaping from the horror that was the Holocaust and uh, imprisonment in the concentration camps. So I have a couple of sections to read, given that background on, on Frankel's story. The prisoner who had lost faith in the future, his future, was doomed. With his loss of belief in the future, he also lost his spiritual hold. He let himself decline and became subject to mental and physical decay. Usually this happened quite suddenly in the form of a crisis, the symptoms of which were familiar to the experienced camp inmate. We all feared this moment, not for ourselves, which would have been pointless, but for our friends. Usually it began with the prisoner refusing one morning to get dressed and wash or to go out on the parade grounds. No entreaties, no blows, no threats had any effect. He just lay there, hardly moving. If this crisis was brought about by an illness, he refused to be taken to the sick bay or to do anything to help himself. He simply gave up. There he remained, lying in his own excreta, and nothing bothered him anymore. I once had a dramatic demonstration of the close link between the loss of faith in the future and this dangerous giving up. A friend who I call just by his first initial F, my senior block warden, a fairly well-known composer and librettist, confided in me one day, I would like to tell you something, doctor. I have had a strange dream. A voice told me that I could wish for something, that I should only say what I wanted to know and all my questions would be answered. What do you think I asked? That I would like to know when the war would be over for me. You know what I mean, doctor, for me. I want to know when we, when our camp would be liberated and our sufferings come to an end. And when did you have this dream? I asked. In February 1945, he answered. It was then the beginning of March. What did your dream voice answer? Furtively, he whispered to me, March 30th. When F told me about his dream, he was still full of hope and convinced that the voice of his dream would be right. But as the promised day drew nearer, the war news which reached our camp made it appear very unlikely that we would be free on the promised date. On March 29th, F suddenly became ill and ran a high temperature. On March 30th, the day his prophecy had told him that the war and suffering would be over for him, he became delirious and lost consciousness. On March 31st, he was dead. To all outward appearances, he had died of typhus. Those who know how close the connection is between the state of mind of a man, his courage and hope or lack of them, and the state of immunity of his body will understand that the sudden loss of hope and courage can have a deadly effect. The ultimate cause of my friend's death was that the expected liberation did not come, and he was severely disappointed. This suddenly lowered his body's resistance against the latent typhus infection. His faith in the future and his will to live had become paralyzed, and his body fell victim to illness, and thus the voice of his dream was right after all. Wow. I mean, we all, I think we all accept that there is a statistically disproportionate uh, likelihood of somebody dying after a major event like a hundredth birthday or something like this. So obviously these mechanisms exist. You and I could talk at length about why evolution would have built such mechanisms. They're a little bit paradoxical, but I don't think so, so hard to understand. Mm -hmm. um, but it makes perfect sense that uh, one's cognitive understanding of there being a point in living further would have a dramatic implication for one's homeostasis effectively. Right. And um, yeah, I, I, it, I think the thing is most of us don't get a chance to, to see it enough to know that it's real. And so it's a, it's a very abstract 
phenomenon, but the camps concentrated this kind of tragedy so much that there was the ability to see the pattern. Yeah, they, they concentrated a lot of things, didn't they? Yeah. Um, I mean, I think we all can see this with regard to much, you know, much less dire outcomes than death. Uh, what isn't included in that little excerpt I just read is that Frankel himself was, I think, in charge at the typhus ward, which meant that he also had typhus because he was exposed all the time. And he, he saw that so many of the prisoners had this low level of typhus that was largely not killing them. And then something would happen and, and people would die. And so in this case, it's not that the man became infected with typhus and then he died. The man had been infected with typhus for a long time. And he had found his meaning. He had found his hope in this external measure over which he had no control and pinned everything on it such that as it became clear that his hope was unfounded, he lost all of his sense of meaning. And this is this is part of the work of, of Frankel, and as we will see in a couple of more slightly shorter excerpts that I'll share, um, that you know, finding your meaning through work or a deed, through love, through emerging stronger from deep hardship, those are his three, that was his taxonomy that, that I read from to begin with, is extraordinary and really really allows for so many possibilities, right? Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm caught here because there are several, there are several different things that are relevant. One, you know, what are we, right? Mm -hmm. Evolutionarily speaking, we are trying to get our genes deeply into the future, which is a kind of a pointless, mundane and devoid of meaning activity. Yeah. On the other hand, we have this marvelous architecture that can make meaning of the universe. And many of us who do make meaning, see it as paramount, even if it is subordinate to the other thing. And so I guess the question is, I think it is apparent that physiology, we all know it involves a lot of trade-offs. We don't, can't be specific about them, but the ability to borrow from some capacity, uh, exists. In other words, there are lots yeah. of things where you can stave off, um, a, set of symptoms and then you crash at the point that you can right I, i've often oh. been impressed when i was a younger person i did a more backpacking i was often impressed by how infrequently you ran into somebody on the trail who you know had the flu or something and was in the terrible pickle that you'd be in out you know in you know in the back country unable to i did once encounter somebody with giardia who who soldiered on but um well, that's a very acute thing that he presu presumably wasn't harboring for a, right. you know, a while. Right, he picked it up in the <laughs> He, back he picked country. it up and yeah. it, it hit him and yeah. Um, but <clears throat> there are lots of things you can borrow. There are lots of resources you can borrow from, but you really are borrowing. The point mm -hmm. is the cost of that borrowing is substantial and it hits you hard. And you can imagine that a prisoner expecting to be freed, um, that if their physiology really did have an understanding that like, I have to get to this point because that's the point at which things will immediately get better. And then it, it is apparent that they are not going to get better. Then mm -hmm. the point is, well, I borrowed. I already spent it. Right. I mm -hmm. borrowed to get me to that day. And now I have nowhere to borrow from. So, um, you know, it's terrifying that our minds are that connected to our physiology, but I don't think, uh, I don't think it's actually all that surprising. Yeah, no, I, I agree. Okay. Next short excerpt. By the same token, every human being has the freedom to change at any instant. I'm going to elide a bunch of what he writes here, but then say, freedom, however, is not the last word. Freedom is only part of the story and half of the truth. Freedom is but the negative aspect of the whole phenomenon whose positive aspect is responsibleness. In fact, freedom is in danger of degenerating into mere arbitrariness unless it is lived in terms of responsibleness. That is why I recommend that the Statue of Liberty on the East Coast be supplemented by a statue of responsibility on the West Coast. So, um, you know, he, he obviously was writing, uh, let's see, this is later, this is in the, in the early 80s, uh, but uh, he did not see what the West Coast of the United States is currently enveloped in and enmeshed in. Boy, could we use that? Could we use a Statue of Liberty and a Statue of Responsibleness, as he calls it, or Responsibility uh, in this case? and and see the tension between them and feel the necessity of both. Yeah, I, I think um, we have a, um, a propensity to squander 
valuable things. Mm -hmm. And it's really important that we learn not to do it, right? So, you know, you can have free speech, for example, and you can use it pointlessly. You can use it to go be a troll and make people's lives worse. And yep, that's a built-in downside of having that freedom. But the point is really, okay, the freedom is important, but it's sort of a prerequisite to doing something useful with it. And But you don't acquire the skill to do something useful with it unless somebody sort of says, look, the objective of the exercise, you know, this is part of why I'm uh, increasingly troubled by the concept of recreation, which I just, I know it seems like, wow, what kind of freaking buzzkill do you have to be to be against recreation? But I think the point is recreation is um, inherently devoid of value and that we have words for recreation that, it, you know, recreation is the, the, uh, um, the hedonistic version and that the point is you're supposed to be having fun as much as you can but fun is supposed to be a reward for doing something awesome right like wooing the right person right you're supposed to have a great deal of fun with that person right but if you can instead have a computer simulation of a right person who actually just sends you the right messages as if you were, you know, really a compelling, you know, partner, then okay, yeah, you may feel just as you would if you had actually like, you know, won somebody's heart that you valued, but what but, did you do? But we know that you don't. I mean, that's that that's what's at the base of this is that we can we, our modern environment, our hyper novelty and our technology have figured out how to trigger many of the short term reward circuits. Um, but what there is no, you know, market benefit in doing and what is also much more complicated to do and no one has figured out how to do is how to actually replace the long term reward circuits without actually doing the thing. Right. Doing, doing, doing the work, doing the thing, finding the value, sourcing your meaning from doing a deed or, or creating a thing or discovering something or finding love or emerging stronger from a terrible set of events. All of these kinds of ways that you can find meaning as Frankel describes them actually then result in joy. And to short circuit the like, yeah, but I just want the joy part. It's going to be shallow. It's inherently shallow. Yeah, it's like behavioral cocaine or something. Mm -hmm. um, and I think I think you've hit the nail on the head, which is that there are these places where something doesn't work because the short term version outcompetes the long term version because you have to wait in order to do your calculation for the long term version to show itself to be superior. Mm -hmm. So yeah, in terms of you know the kind of you know joy and happiness that arises from some exercise of deep meaning, which takes a long time and somebody who can trigger that same circuit, you know, within an hour if you pay the right amount, right? The point is, yeah, it's really hard for the meaning thing to show itself to be better. Yeah. And this is part of what we, you know, th this is what markets do very, very badly, right? They yeah. allow people to figure out how to trigger every one of these reward circuits um, without your investment because, of course, then you'll pay with money to short, to, you know, to, make, to take the shortcut. Right. But it's not good for you. It's not good for you. And well, there's a lot to say here. Let's uh, let me go to my penultimate excerpt here. As to the causation of the feeling of meaninglessness, one may say, albeit in an oversimplifying vein, that people have enough to live by, but nothing to live for. They have the means, but no meaning. To be sure, some actually, I'm going to pause here for a moment. Let me just remind the audience that this is a man who lived through years in the concentration camps and through dint of a lot of luck and most people were not lucky but also a set of skills and a set and an, and an understanding of how to find meaning and therefore to hold on to hope he survived he was also exceedingly lucky and most of the people who were capable of doing exactly what he did just weren't lucky but here is a man who is not accepting that you cannot change your life and that you cannot take responsibility for your life. So let me let me start. Okay. Oh, oh, go well, on. I wanted to add something yeah, to that, yeah. which is um, the way you describe the story. It is also a fact that his failure to understand that the loved ones he was living to see again were already gone. Yeah presumably saved his life because they provided meaning and prevented him from getting into the state where he just wouldn't get out of bed and would die. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this is the reality of the human animal. This is the place where if you are too narrow in your understanding, you will say, well, you know, 
it was a fiction that kept him alive, right? He believed they were alive, but they really weren't. And so, you know, it's nothing. And the point is, it's exactly the opposite. It's you know? the opposite of nothing. Right. Mm -hmm. the, for the same reason that we do not behave like most animals and simply at the point that we discover that uh, an intimate of ours is gone, just move on and say, okay, well, I guess I got to, you know, uh, you know, not set a place for them at the dinner table. And I, you know, I guess they won't be uh, picking up my dry cleaning and, you know, lots of creatures move on. Some but, creatures don't. Right. And the point is there's a reason for that. And it's not because being debilitated by sadness is good. It's because something is very good and being debilitated by sadness is inextricably linked to it. Right. And when we talk about we talk about grief, we've talked about grief a fair bit, we talk about it in the book. Uh, I am often thrown by otherwise very savvy intellectually sophisticated thinkers drawing this hard, this bright line between humans and non-human animals in this regard. All of the, many of the usual suspects, by which I mean the long-lived social organisms with long childhoods and generational overlap where they live with multiple generations in the same social group, have grief. You have the famous case of a chimp whose name I've forgotten, I think out of Gambi, I think it was one of the, one of the chimps in the troop that, that Godal originally uh, habituated and studied carried around the increasingly mummified corpse of her infant for weeks, I believe. Uh, elephants uh, will will return over and over and over again to the corpse of, of a dead one, especially the matriarch uh, in a family. I think baboons are known to do this. Uh, We've seen it in whales. We see it in whales for sure. Whales. Yeah. Dogs. Dogs. Um. <clears throat> so uh, it is not this is this is a place where a a a strictly humans are special and everything else is different understanding of the universe really does fall short it, it, it really fails to understand what we are and what grief is well in fact it short circuits the important meaning what yeah. you and i get because we know what it means we know all those organisms are very far separated on the phylogeny what that means is yes. that again and again every time uh, selection builds a highly social creature with generational overlap. It cannot help but inflict grief upon it. Grief that is so reliable that we can see it easily in these other creatures. It is impossible to miss, in fact. Grief and is the downside of love. Grief is the downside of love. And, you know, boy, is that a lesson about meaning. Right. Right. And it doesn't require that the one you love remains alive. Right. The right. point is, it's a it's a real connection to something, and yeah, don't, don't don't miss it because you can do a narrow analysis in which you know, oh, someone is suddenly you know their line on the phylogeny has stopped. Right. Okay, uh, I'm going to restart this little excerpt uh, from again, man's search for meaning. As to the causation of the feeling of meaninglessness, one may say, albeit in an oversimplifying vein, that people have enough to live by, but nothing to live for. They have the means, but no meaning. To be sure, some do not even have the means. In particular, I think of the mass of people who are today unemployed. Fifty years ago, I published a study devoted to a specific type of depression I had diagnosed in cases of young patients suffering from what I called unemployment neurosis. And I could show that this neurosis really originated in a twofold erroneous identification. Being jobless was equated with being useless, and being useless was equated with having a meaningless life. Consequently, whenever I succeeded in persuading the patients to volunteer in youth organizations, adult education, public libraries, and the like, in other words, as soon as they could fill their abundant free time with some sort of unpaid but meaningful activity, their depression disappeared, although their economic situation had not changed and their hunger was the same. The truth is that man does not live by welfare alone. That line right there, the truth is that man does not live by welfare alone, strikes me as the incisive rejoinder to so much that is wrong in so-called lefty politics at the moment. The idea that all we have to do is erase the current problems that people have, um, that we have identified as the main problems that they have, and then everything will be fine. And we'll t we, I think we'll talk a little bit later about how, how the naming of situations uh, affects how we view what we should do. How, for instance, just to jump ahead a little bit, um, 
how referring to people as homeless, as opposed to talking about people on the streets who are itinerant or transient or mentally ill or drug addicted, uh, allows us to imagine that providing them permanent homes will solve all of the other problems when, of course, there is abundant evidence that this is not going to be sufficient. Uh, and that, to me, that brings us right back to the truth is that man does not live by welfare alone. Yes, which actually goes back to the taxonomy that you raised at the beginning, because one of the things, one of the paradoxes um, is that kids in wealthy families have all sorts of advantages with which you might imagine they would be at advantage in pursuing meaning, but they may in fact be hobbled because they have it too easy. And so learning to produce meaning is not automatic. Mm -hmm. Whereas, you know, yes. let's say you come from hard scrabble background and in order to get out of it, you have to build a business. Well, then by the time you've done that, you know something. Mm -hmm. And so what meaning is, is more intuitive to you than somebody who would have to bootstrap it, you know, in a circumstance where it simply wasn't required to get all sorts of rewards. And um, although Evergreen is a strange exception to this, the, the chaos that has erupted on college campuses in the last five plus years has largely been a problem of the private elite schools with the private elite kids um, who um, come from some family wealth, whereas the community colleges don't have this problem so much. Now, increasingly, the faculty and the administrators at those schools are bringing the problems to them. Um, but at least as of five and seven years ago, when we were still embedded in higher ed ourselves, what we were hearing from our colleagues uh, at community colleges versus at the elite schools was the students at the elite schools were very interested in buying into a lot of the everyone's a victim ideology. And the people at the community colleges, many of which were paying their own way through school, had full-time jobs, maybe they already had families, they had no family support, they had lots of stuff going on and they were sacrificing and they knew exactly what they were sacrificing in order to be there, they weren't having any of it. Yeah, and actually now that you mention it, <clears throat> I would say that what happened at Evergreen was that the faculty brought it. Yes. And, uh, you know, it's not to say no student brought it through the door because it was in the ethos and it was circulating uh, on social media. And so mm -hmm. many students will have had contact with it. But Although I, what we saw was actually it was um, to, to the degree that we could see where it started among the students, it was among the, the, the rich students. The rich students, sure. Because yeah. they had the built-in sense of safety mm -hmm. that allowed them to experiment with uh, anarchy. Right. <laughs> You've got to be pretty safe to want anarchy. <laughs> Oh, the right. built-in safety, which allows you to experiment with anarchy. There it is. Yeah, there it yep. is. But yep. um, but I do think also the comparison between our classes and the classes that um, melted the school down yeah. is pretty clear, right? Mm -hmm. The fact is lots of students walked through the doors to our classes. They didn't know what they were going to get, but what they got was, uh, you know, a broad-minded view of you know, where we are. And it wasn't a view that said things are fair, you know, pull yourself up by your bootstraps. It was a thing that said, you know, we're, we do have built in suspicions of other races and we will f default into that if we don't have better opportunities. So we better protect the, you know, we better protect an egalitarian system as an alternative. And I think the fact is you can actually, you can see this. I, I, I keep mentioning that I didn't understand when the students that I'd never met, 50 of them that I'd never met, confronted me at my classroom, I did not know for months until I had seen Mike Nana's very elegant little documentary, I didn't know what it was that they had intended to accomplish because the chances that I was going to you know, resign or be fired because they were chanting at me were zero. What they expected was my students to defect mm -hmm. and my students didn't think to defect because they knew me so well that they knew that what was being said was preposterous. And so really what it says is you've got all these people ready to be educated. You've got faculty who are all about, you know, this uh, victim hierarchy schema. And then you've got other faculty who are about, no, there's a more subtle way of looking at this and actually the students will go either way. Well, I think actually, I think uh, if you'll forgive me, I can fit this into my taxonomy uh, that I created before Evergreen blew up at the point that I was growing quite weary with many of our colleagues. Um, and you know, you've heard this formulation many times before, but what I said was that the bar, uh, the very low bar that anyone who is allowed to uh, instruct undergraduates should meet is that they uh, know something of value that they can communicate and that they fundamentally believe in the humanity of all of their students. And too many, too many college faculty fail on, frankly, both of those counts. Yes, they would and not belly up to that bar of yours. <sighs> they certainly couldn't, couldn't go over it. Um, but the, the, the point there was, I don't remember now. <laughs> 
Um, <laughs> damn, I feel bad. Sorry. Uh, yeah. Okay. So let me just finish up what I was going to be doing then. Um, you want to riff while I try to remember what I was talking about? Um, well, let's see. No, we were- it's, it's okay. I'll just, okay. I'll, I'll just skip it. Um, okay. So the final, the final excerpt here from Man's Search for Meaning is from the final, the very final sentences of his original edition. This is what he wrote in those nine days within a year of being freed from the concentration camp. He says, and I can't find. I apologize. I can't find the right sentence. Where is it? Um, it's supposed to be right here. Book darts never lie. Uh, book darts never lie. Oh, there it is. Okay. Um, in the concentration camps, for example, in this living laboratory and on this testing ground, we watched and witnessed some of our comrades behave like swine while others behaved like saints. Man has both potentialities within himself. Which one is actualized depends on decisions, but not on conditions. Our generation is realistic, for we have come to know man as he really is. After all, man is that being who invented the gas chambers of Auschwitz. However, he is also that being who entered those gas chambers upright, with the Lord's Prayer, or the Shema Yisrael, on his lips. We are both. We are both things. We are the worst of what we have been, and we are the best of what we have been. And it is to our enduring detriment that we imagine that we are only one, or that we imagine that any human being has only one in him. And this is also one of Frankel's uh, repeating points throughout the book, that he saw he saw goodness in some of the concentration camp guards, and he saw evil in some of his fellow prisoners. And it was harder to view evil in the prisoners than it was to view evil in the guards. And it was more reassuring to see any little tiny hints of goodness among the guards than to be good to one another as prisoners, because in both cases those were unexpected. But the fact that they're unexpected is in part his point, that uh, we all can behave differently than we are currently behaving in both directions. And we should not either uh, be held responsible for uh, the failures of the group, nor should we hold ourselves to a past uh, that we may feel we did not do what we do the best that we could do. We can do better in the future. Yeah, you know, um, it's interesting to hear the idea that he saw evil in his in his fellow inmates sometimes and saw goodness in the guards. It really can't be otherwise. And I think this is one of the points that uh, Jordan Peterson makes really, really well. And people have a hard time with it. But, Mm -hmm. you know, and I think we make it a different way, which Mm -hmm. is that, you know, evolution has built all of our best characteristics and our worst. And the real question is, are we going to be a slave to the mechanism that simply wants to get our genes into the future so badly that it will default to whichever mode is most effective at that moment? Or are we going to say, sorry, evolution, you blew it giving us the ability to choose and we are going to choose something that's worthy of us and we are going to reject things, no matter how effective they would be at getting our genes into the future that are unacceptable. And that's really where we have to be. And we are losing ground on that at the moment, which is why some of us are so animated about the, you know, the little battles over nonsense that will be forgotten 20 years from now because no no rational person could possibly believe it it doesn't matter the point is that is the sound of us relinquishing control to the mechanisms in which we demonize each other in order to justify what we do to each other Mm -hmm. and we simply mustn't simply mustn't if you have any idea what happens after you make that step you know that we simply mustn't Mm 